I'm going to speak about consciousness starting from a completely different point of view. I'm not starting with the brain. Um, I'm not starting with a cerebrocentric view of consciousness, but with the, um, the bigger picture. It's been taken for granted by almost every civilization and traditional society that there are many forms of consciousness in the universe, not just ours and not just those of animals, other animals. Um, so uh, it's been often assumed that the entire universe is conscious. And this, these, this view of consciousness doesn't try and tie it all down to particular regions of the brain or interactions or uh, electrical impulses going from one bit to another. Um, it sees consciousness in a completely different way. And the reason why people in all these cultures think that there are many forms of consciousness beyond our own is because they experience them through mystical experiences, through altered states of consciousness, uh, through spiritual practices, through psychedelics traditionally taken in a number of cultures around the world. Uh, people have the experience of being in contact with a greater consciousness than their own. Um, when Sir Alistair Hardy in the 1960s started the Religious Experience Research Unit in Oxford, he was asking people in Britain if they'd had experiences that seemed to involve a conscious presence greater than their own, mystical experiences. He was astonished. Thousands of reports poured in. It turned out these are much more common than anyone had previously thought. Most people don't talk about them because they, they're shy to do so. They, they're afraid they'd be classified as mentally ill or something like that. Um, uh, and, but recent surveys have shown that uh, as many as 50% of the population have had uh, experiences of other kinds of reality, near-death experiences, spontaneous mystical experiences, including ones that occur in childhood, um, and uh, other kinds of altered states of consciousness, which suggest that their consciousness is part of something greater than themselves. Now, in, in ancient Greece, they had the Eleusinian mysteries. Um, most of the, uh, the, the culture there was influenced by this kind of mystery cult, of, um, uh, which involved an initiation in a cave, which involved taking psychoactive substances. We don't know what uh, they were. Um, but this was a pervasive fe feature of Greek philosophy. And Plato, in his book The Timaeus, talks about the conscious universe, <clears throat> what he says is, This world came to be, in very truth, a living creature with soul and reason, a single visible living creature containing within itself all living things whose nature is of the same order. So this is a vision of the entire cosmos as a living being, a living organism. And this kind of view was in, inherited um, by uh, medieval philosophers in, in, in Europe, in the universities and in the cathedral schools. Um, they were also influenced very much by the philosophy of Aristotle, who thought that all living beings have souls. The soul is the form of the body. It's what shapes the body and it's what attracts uh, a being towards its end point. An acorn, a, as it germinates into an oak seedling, is pulled towards the mature form of an oak tree by the soul of the oak. So plants have souls, animals have souls, the planets have souls, the stars have souls, according to this view. In fact, the Greeks, including Plato, called the stars and the planets and the sun the visible gods. And indeed, we still call the planets by the names of the gods and goddesses, Venus, Mars, Mercury, and so on. So, um, in medieval Europe, uh, this was the standard worldview. Uh, theologians like St. Thomas Aquinas integrated this Greek view, particularly Aristotle's view, with Christian theology to produce a view, an animistic view of nature. Nature is alive, the earth is alive, the planets and the stars are alive, they're conscious beings, the whole universe is a conscious being, animals and plants have souls, and the human rational mind is embedded in a level of the human soul which relates us to plants, which shaping our body. The vegetative soul shapes our bodies and underlies regeneration and wound healing. Um, the animal soul that we have, we share with animals, gives us our animal instincts and emotions like fear, hunger, thirst, sexual desire, and so on. 
Uh, but the rational mind uh, is that which is specifically human and to do with conscious thought, language, and reason. And that was the standard view in the Middle Ages. Now, the reason I'm saying all this is because it's important to realize what a completely radical break the 17th century mechanistic revolution in science was with everything that had gone before in our own culture and in all others. In the 17th century, the scientific revolution was a revolution precisely because it denied uh, these traditional views. For the uh, founders of modern science, nature was not a living organism, it was a machine. Um, animals and plants were not living organisms, they were machines, automata, unconscious, inanimate automata. Um, uh, the human body was a machine. And in the vision of René Descartes, who's founded this mechanistic philosophy most explicitly, the whole universe is made of inanimate matter, which works mechanically by pushing and uh, by being pushed from the past um, through physical, mechanical causes. Uh, the stars and the planets are mechanical objects made of unconscious matter. The Earth's an un unconscious object. Our body is, the animal bodies are, plants are. Uh, the only things that were not a mechanical uh, and unconscious in the universe were God, angels, and human minds. Basically, what Descartes did was deanimate the whole of nature, drain the soul out of the whole of nature, so that all was left in nature was inanimate matter. But outside nature were God, angels, and human minds. And God was supposed to have created the world machine in the first place by being a brilliant engineer and mathematician, I pressed the start button, and then it was all supposed to go on more or less automatically thereafter. So we have an idea of completely autonomous, unconscious, mechanical universe, uh, with the only role for God left to being to start it off and to interact with human minds, which were the only non-material things left in the universe. And this is Cartesian dualism, and it dominated science for the first two or three centuries of its existence. And it created three splits, really, a split between religion and science. Religion got God, angels, and human minds, and morality. Science got the entire physical universe, including the human body. It created a split between mind and body in ourselves, that our minds were somehow utterly separate from our bodies, and it, but interacted with them in a way that was profoundly mysterious. <coughs> he thought it happened in the pineal gland. Modern uh, Cartesians think it happens in the cerebral cortex. It's basically the same theory. It's just moved a couple of inches. Um, and um, the, it also created a split between man and the animals. We have rational conscious minds and purposes Animals don't. They're just machines. Therefore, we can treat them as cruelly as we like in vivisection experiments. We can grow them in factories for factory farming. They're just mechanisms. That's the view which uh, dominated science right up until the 20th century. But there was another movement within science in the 19th century, uh, science and philosophy, which, uh, where people tried to go beyond this dualistic view. A lot of people felt it's to have two completely different kinds of thing doesn't make sense. There should be just one reality. So one school of thought, the idealists, said the one reality is consciousness. Everything is ultimately conscious. Uh, the, the consciousness underlies everything. Matter is kind of done, done mind. This is the school of idealism in philosophy. Idealism here means the primacy of consciousness. It doesn't mean being idealistic about helping others or making the world a better place. It means um, the, the focus on consciousness as the primary, indeed only, reality. That school of thought is undergoing a resurgence today. The best known exponent of it is Bernardo Castrup, uh, a philosopher of mind. Um, uh, but the other, school, the other uh, uh, school of thought in the 19th century that finally came, became dominant and became the, the dominant philosophy of science was materialism. And the materialist said there's no such thing as this realm of immaterial spirit. It doesn't do anything. You can't measure it. You can't weigh it. You can't see it. Uh, therefore, it doesn't exist. God and angels don't exist. They're just figments of the imagination. So at one stroke, God and angels disappear from this mechanical universe. And that's all that's left is human consciousness, um, the only thing left out of this Cartesian dualism. 
Then you have the problem for materialists that they haven't been able to get rid of human consciousness. They've got rid of God and angels, but this human consciousness annoyingly persists. Um, and this is where um, materialist philosophers have such a terrible job trying to explain it away. As Daniel Seth said, you know, Daniel Dennett's book Consciousness Explained is really an attempt to explain consciousness away as a kind of illusion. The problem is that by saying consciousness is an illusion doesn't explain it because illusion is itself a mode of consciousness. And for those who say consciousness is merely an epiphenomenon, uh, it doesn't really do anything, and consciousness has no activity. Uh, we, we may experience it, but it doesn't do anything. It's like a shadow of the activity of the nervous system. It has no agency, can't interfere with physical causality. We have no free will. This is standard materialist stuff. Um, but the trouble is that it's a hard problem because all attempts to explain it away uh, in the end run into in intolerable problems. John Searle, the philosopher of mind, um, described the debate within the philosophy of mind over the last 50 years as follows. A philosopher advances a materialist theory of the mind. He then encounters difficulties. Criticisms usually take a more or less technical form, but in fact, underlying the technical objections is a much deeper objection. The theory in question has left out some essential feature of the mind. And this leads to ever more frenzied attempts to stick with the materialist thesis. Well, some philosophers have decided to give up on that task uh, of trying to stick with the materialist thesis. And um, th that's really one of the origins of the modern versions of panpsychism, the idea there's forms of consciousness in many different levels of nature. Galen Strawson is one of the leaders of this new panpsychist movement. And um, he argues that if we assume there's some kind of level of mind mentality, experience, or consciousness, uh, even in atoms and electrons, then the appearance of consciousness, the emergence of consciousness in, in humans, is no longer something completely different emerging from utterly unconscious matter. It's not a difference in kind, it's a difference of degree. And this is why many contemporary philosophers are now going over to panpsychism. Uh, another one whose book recently came out is Philip Goff, his book Galileo's Error, is a, a clear and, um, uh, I think, a forceful and well-argued statement of the panpsychist position. And his motive is primarily to deal with the hard problem of human consciousness. Um, because if consciousness is not just confined to human brains or animal brains, then it's easier to understand why we're conscious, because consciousness is no longer something special just for us, it's something much more widely distributed in nature. A more sophisticated and mathematical version of this is integrated information theory of Giulio Tononi, um, who points out that consciousness has an integrative capacity. It doesn't work unless there's a high degree of complexity which has to be integrated, and consciousness works by integration. Um, and, and so that's its defining characteristic. Um, there's a lot of technical literature on this, um, but I'm just giving a, a, an overview. Now, as soon as we start discussing panpsychism, uh, we realize this is not a new philosophy at all. As I've already mentioned, this is more or less what uh, practically everyone in ancient Greece thought, and also what uh, in animistic forms is found in practically all traditional cultures everywhere in the world. Um, uh, but in European philosophy in the 17th century, in response to Descartes, um, there was already a kind of panpsychist reaction. Um, two leading philosophers then were panpsychists. One was Spinoza, the Jewish Dutch philosopher, uh, who argued that God and nature are the same. Uh, that it, it, nature is like the body of God, God is like the mind of nature. And um, so his was a, a panpsychist, even pantheist philosophy. God and nature were identical. It's just looked at from different points of view. Another and very interesting 17th century philosopher was Leibniz, uh, a German philosopher, um, who argued that the whole universe was made up of monads, self-organizing units, 
and each self-organizing unit, including atoms, um, mirrored the universe consciously from its own point of view. So the universe was full of all sorts of individual beings with minds that each mirrored it from their own point of view. And each one mirrored it differently because every monad was in a different place. Just like everyone in this room uh, is mirroring this room, seeing this room from a different point of view, from their own point of view. Uh, but everyone's seeing it differently because you can't have two people in the same place at the same time. It's what I, I, Leibniz called the identity of indiscernibles. Um, so the, um, he was saying the whole universe is full of minds which are all mirroring the universe from every different point of view. The most interesting 20th century panpsychist was Alfred North Whitehead, a British philosopher um, who uh, was a mathematician as well. He wrote a fundamental book in 20th century mathematics called Principia Mathematica with his student Bertrand Russell uh, when they were both at Trinity College, Cambridge. And Alfred North Whitehead, because he was a mathematician, was the first philosopher who properly understood quantum theory. In the 1920s, when quantum theory was just coming into being, Whitehead got it straight away. Most philosophers weren't mathematicians, couldn't follow it, but Whitehead instantly realized what a radical break quantum theory was. He showed that in quantum theory, um, which treats uh, light and matter as wave-like entities, the quanta are wave-like, and because they're wave-like, uh, um, Whitehead realized that um, they, you couldn't have a wave at an instant. You can't have an instantaneous wave. Think of waves on the sea. You can't take an instantaneous slice of a wave and say, here's, here's a wave at an instant. A wave takes time to wave in, and it takes space to wave in. So it's spread out in time and space. So you can't define it in a particular time or place. And that's the fundamental reason for the so-called uncertainty principle in quantum mechanics, that um, fundamental particles are wave-like. Everything, in fact, is wave-like. Um, um, atoms are wave patterns. Uh, the nucleus is a pattern of waves, too. And the electrons in their different orbitals are, are, are um, resonant waves of activity. So what Whitehead showed is that matter is not stuff. 19th century physics had treated stu matter as stuff, like little billiard balls. The atoms were like tiny billiard balls, hard, impenetrable stuff that just persisted. He showed that actually what modern quantum physics has shown is that matter is a process. And it's a process because it's a wave. Everything is wave-like, even the smallest particles, uh, even the smallest subatomic particles that you find in l the Large Hadron Collider are wave-like. Um, and if it's a wave, and if it's a process, then it takes place in time. And if it takes place in time, it has a polarity in time, a past and a future pole. And what Whitehead argued was that this completely transforms our view of the nature of matter. His most original idea about this, I think, the one I find most exciting and interesting, is that it gives us a way of thinking of the relation of mind and body. Uh, uh, in terms of time rather than space. We're used to the idea that the mind is the inside, the body is the outside, there's the external world, the inner world. We use these metaphors all the time. They're spatial metaphors, my inner life, the inner world, inner consciousness. And indeed, from a materialist point of view, the brain literally is inner. You know, your thoughts are supposed to be nothing but the activity of your brain. They're inside your head, they're inside and the external world's outside, and the body's outside the brain, most of it. Um, so um, th that we're used to that spatial metaphor. It comes into ordinary language as well. We're less used to the um, time version that Whitehead was putting forward. And what he was suggesting is that the mental pole, the pole of the mind, is the future pole. The physical pole, the body pole, is the past pole. He pointed out that even in uh, quantum theory, when you're do working out the equations of quantum theory, the Schrodinger wave equation, for example, is the equation that enables you to predict all the possible things that an electron or other particle could do. You fire off an electron from a cathode ray tube. 
in a cathode ray tube. And uh, the Schrodinger wave equation describes all the possible things it could do. Now, these are possibilities. They're not physical facts. Uh, they're part of physics, but they're not physical. The, it's, uh, they coexist as possibilities. But as soon as the electron interacts with something, a measuring apparatus or with another atom, um, then all these possibilities collapse down until you've got one measurable fact which is now a physical fact. It's now the body, as it were. The body of that electron has a definite place. You can measure it in a particular place. Uh, and it's sometimes called the collapse of the wave function. Well, what Whitehead uh, showed, really, was that this is a general principle about the way the minds work. Our own minds are arenas of possibility, our own conscious minds. Um, our consciousness is, is a, an arena where we hold together a range of possibilities. If we don't have many possibilities, we don't need to be conscious of it. And most of our habits don't involve considering possibilities. We just do it the same way we've done it before. Habits are generally unconscious. They're mental, but they're unconscious. Conscious minds are concerned with possibilities and choosing among them. So, um, for example, all of us um, chose to come here today. We could have done all sorts of other things this afternoon, uh, but we chose to come here. And among the many possibilities, we chose this one, and we made it happen. It's realized it's now a physical fact. We can be measured, photographed, weighed in this room. Uh, it's a physical fact we're here. And our mind's now open to new possibilities. So it's a constant interplay of possibility becoming physical, but as soon as it's physical, it's in the past, and then new possibilities open in the future. So this is Whitehead's um, conception of how minds work, and it gives us a way of thinking of consciousness as something that deals with possibility. Uh, it's a way of, uh, I find, a very helpful way of thinking about the nature of consciousness. And since possibilities aren't physical, um, they're virtual. Uh, they're, they're virtual futures um, among which we choose. Um, it, it helps us to understand that consciousness is part of nature, but it's not something you can physically measure, any more than you can measure all the possibilities that an electron has. You can only measure the physical facts when the wave function collapses, and you can say, well, these, the, the, the Schrodinger wave equation just gives us the probability distribution of what might happen, not what will happen. So um, Whitehead was also a very important part of uh, the the birth of the holistic or organismic philosophy of nature. The old me mechanistic materialist view was that we should explain everything in terms of the smallest things. The atoms are the ultimate physical reality, and therefore reducing chemistry to atoms is the way chemistry should go. Reducing life to molecules is the way biology should go. Reduce it to the smallest things in living organisms, molecules. Uh, so it's a matter of reducing to the smallest, because smallest is best. And that's why molecular biology has an enormously high status within biology, uh, because it's dealing with the smallest bits of living organisms, genes, proteins, etc. Um, but what Whitehead pointed out is that um, atoms are not the ultimate particles. Atoms themselves are structures of activity with a nucleus and electron orbitals, and they're all processes. Um, atoms are processes, molecules are processes, um, and that molecules are like, they're like organisms. An atom is like a microscopic organism. A molecule is an organism composed of atoms which are whole, uh, have a wholeness that goes beyond the sum of the parts. Um, in the same way in organisms, a cell is self-organizing. It has its own membrane, its own limits, its own structure and activity. But cells can be organized in tissues where there's a wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts. They're in organs, in organisms, in, in societies of organisms like flocks of birds or schools of fish, uh, in ecosystems, in planets. And planets are within solar systems, which, again, have a wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts, and solar systems are within galaxies. So we have organisms at all levels of complexity, and you can't reduce them all to ultimate particles. And the bottom dropped out of the atom long ago, and an attempt to explain everything in terms of the ultimate particle is no longer the way science works. I mean, it never really has worked that way. 
You don't try and explain the facts of sociology or the facts of physiology in terms of hadrons or electrons and so on. Um, you explain them in terms of physiological processes. Uh, in science, in, in effect, although not in theory, is actually holistic. You study things at their own level. Well, <clears throat> uh, if we take this view, then we see that uh, this holistic view of nature uh, suggests that self-organizing systems um, have a kind of mind or consciousness uh, or an organizing capacity, their own purposes, their own goals, which in modern dynamics are called attractors. Um, and it also shows that certain kinds of things are not self-organizing and are not likely to be conscious. An atom, a molecule, a cell, a tissue, an organ, a flock of birds, a, a galaxy, a solar system, have a wholeness that's more than the sum of the parts and may have some kind of mind dealing with their possible future actions. But things which are mere composites um, uh, are not likely to be conscious in this way. This is also a point that uh, Tononi makes in his Integrated Information Theory. A table, a chair, a computer, a car, um, a rock that's just ro ro rolled down a mountain are not self-organizing wholes. Um, if they were, we wouldn't need factories. We'd grow them on farms instead of making them in factories by putting components together. So um, the very worst possible model for nature is a machine, because a machine is um, uh, made out of parts that are put together in factories according to a design, an intelligent design which is outside the machinery, and, it, uh, and fulfilling human purposes which are also outside the machinery. Organisms have their own organizing capacity within them, their self-organizing, their own purposes. Um, and uh, uh, so uh, this kind of panpsychism is not saying, as some people assume, when people are sneeringly dismissive of panpsychism, they say, oh, you're saying this chair's conscious, ha ha. You know, you get that kind of just sneering dismissal. Um, many of you will have encountered it. You know, well, this rock is this. They always pick cups, rocks, socks, chairs, <laughs> computers as examples, um, and uh, which uh, no one is claiming, no serious panpsychist is claiming that these are conscious. They may be made of conscious crystals or with a very low level of consciousness or atoms, uh, but the sock or the chair or the computer is not a conscious being. And, and, and self-organizing systems have their own ends or goals. Um, and again, you get the contrast with if you if you're trying to get somewhere, you get into a car, the car doesn't have any goal of its own where it wants to go. It's, it'll go wherever you want it to. If you get onto a horse, the horse may well have its own idea about where it wants to go. It's, it's happened to me in Ireland once. I rented a horse with some friends, and uh, to, I'm not an expert horse rider, and I found myself going down paths that I didn't think were part of the standard route until I found myself arriving at a stable. The horse had simply gone home. It didn't want to go on this <laughs> long ride with me on its back. Um, so um, this, this gives us a view of how minds might work. And it also shows that if, if we're talking about plants, are plants conscious? I mean, there's a whole conference every year in London called Plant Consciousness now. There are whole books on plant intelligence and the secret life of trees and so on. Um, if plants are conscious, they're likely to be conscious about things where they have a choice. They're not likely to be conscious uh, about things which are just purely habitual. Same as us. We're not conscious of most of our mental activity. Most of our lives, are, uh, we're creatures of habit. Most of our um, uh, mental life is habitual. Um, we only use our consciousness when we're thinking about possible actions we have to choose between. Now, I think the interesting point about this panpsychist argument in the present uh, climate is that most panpsychists who are around today, Strawson, Goff, Tononi, Koch, the uh, neuroscientist who used to work with Francis Crick, uh, who used to be an absolutely hardline reductionist materialist, has recently gone over to panpsychism as well. This is a large-scale movement uh, within philosophy and neuroscience. Um, but the main reason they, uh, they, they've adopted panpsychism is to try and explain 
the hard problem, human consciousness. Um, so they talk about electrons, atoms, molecules, maybe cells and tissues. But they stop when you get to human beings. I think this debate is most interesting when you carry on. You know, flocks of animals or social groups, ecosystems, the whole planet. I mean, uh, we already have a holistic view of Gaia, the planet, in the Gaia hypothesis, which is telling us that the entire planet is like um, a living organism. Um, and then if we carry on to the solar system, and particularly to the sun, um, I'm particularly interested in this question of, is the sun conscious? And as soon as you raise that question, you realize that you're breaking a taboo. You know, as a modern educated person, you're not meant to ask that question. It's, it, you're meant to sneer if somebody says, is the sun conscious? You're meant to dismiss it as absurd or ridiculous or childish. And the reason it's so easily dismissed as childish and ridiculous is that practically all humans, except us, have taken it for granted. Uh, so the, the idea is we're better than them because we're smarter, more educated, and more scientific, and they're all wallowing in ridiculous superstitions. Uh, also, children think the sun's conscious. Uh, that's why they draw it with a smiley face. Again, proof uh, <laughs> that it's a, a childish superstition. Um, well, in, in most cultures, people think the sun is conscious and usually think of it as a god or a goddess. The Greeks thought of the sun as a god, Apollo, the Romans as a god, Sol. Um, uh, but uh, some people think of it as a god, the, the Hindus, Surya. Um, but some people think of the sun as a goddess, the Japanese. Uh, for the Japanese, the sun is a very important goddess in their whole cosmology. In the, in the cosmologies of Northern Europe, the sun was a goddess. And that's why um, in German and in the Germanic language, the sun is feminine, die Sonne, and the moon is masculine, der Mont. Uh, whereas in the Romance languages, it's the other way around. Le Soleil in French is masculine sun, and la lune, the moon, is feminine. So sometimes people think, oh, the moon's feminine, the sun's masculine, etc. It, it depends on the mythic system you're working with. And um, I personally think that the, this view of the sun and similar aspects of the natural world um, is one reason for the evolution of the English language as we know it. In parentheses, um, you know, think about the evolution of our language. Um, the people living in England at the time of the Norman Conquest were speaking Germanic languages, Anglo-Saxon and other Germanic languages, in which the sun is feminine. Um, the Norman invaders spoke French, and the court language in England for several centuries was French. And the English language as we know it is a kind of hybrid of French and German, or French-type and German-type languages. And what did the, our ancestors do when they were trying to deal with the gender of the sun? You know, one lot say it's feminine, the other lot say it's masculine, the moon. Again, the opposite way around. How do you deal with that? Well, what they did do was expanded the neuter gender, which in Germanic languages, there's masculine, feminine, and neuter, expanded neuter to include practically everything except people and ships. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and, um, and so we neutralized the entire world in English. Um, and uh, I think that uh, this, these conflicting mythologies and genders are actually probably one of the main reasons why that happened. But that's an aside. Um, my point here is that traditional cultures have thought of the sun as alive and conscious. And they actually, um, in India, I lived in India for seven years, and in, in 